uh, I've heard you speak before, and I think one of the techniques you talk about is how to assess or screen individuals for their risk of heat-related consequences. Well, my background's in emergency medicine. And so I feel like in the emergency department, uh, I would be doing risk assessment sort of after the fact. Basically, somebody would present to the emergency department with a heat-related condition. We'd identify it, manage it, and then we'd talk about how to avoid it in the future. So kind of like secondary prevention, if we want to use like, you know, kind of blanket right. medicine terms here. But I think that there's a really huge opportunity for primary prevention or preventing it before it actually has that first occurrence, um, both via primary care clinicians as well as through public health messaging. And I, I think that there is a, or I know that there's this article that came out in 2022 in the New England Journal of Medicine um, by Sorensen and colleagues, and it was called Treatment and Prevention of Heat-Related Illness. And I bring this up because it covers screening and um, and prevention for heat-related illness really quite well. Um, and what they say in this or what they recommend in this is that clinicians should, for everybody, um, before the hot season begins where they live, the clinicians should be screening all patients for their risk of heat-related illness and then be able to identify heat vulnerable individuals. And so they can do this in a couple of different ways, um, or there's a couple of different steps to, to do this. And this is something that I, I do talk about um, when I speak uh, nationally and locally uh, uh, on this topic. And so this includes looking at individual factors in the, the patients to understand their susceptibility. And so understanding what's the patient's age, as we've already covered, young mm -hmm. patients and older patients tend not to be able to fare as well in the heat. Whether that patient or individual has any coexisting conditions, especially lung or kidney conditions, uh, if they're pregnant, if they use certain medications or drugs that maybe um, may make them more susceptible to heat-related illness for whatever reason, whether they have like cognitive impairments or disabilities, um, whether they have social isolation or have immobility where they're not able to move themselves out of a hot environment um, if they do recognize that it that it is actually hot. So. After that, when screening individuals for um, their risk of heat-related illness, it's important to make note of the individual's heat exposure risks. And so this includes the ambient temperature as well as the humidity in the geographic location where that individual lives. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in North Carolina. Uh, probably the uh, heat exposure risk where I live is going to be greater than somebody that, say, lives in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Mm -hmm. Also looking at heat amplification. And so we know that there are things called urban heat islands. And so in urban areas where there's a lot more um, pavement or concrete, less green space, individuals that live in those areas are gonna have higher risk of heat exposure. Also considering occupation. Is your patient an indoor uh, worker that doesn't have access to cooling? Are they stuck in like, um, you know, checking in a, in a toll booth or something like that where there's not like air conditioning? Um, or are they outdoor agricultural worker where they don't necessarily have the access to, um, you know, hydration adequately? Um, whether these people have access to cooling at home or if there's any like indoor heat sources that might be running um, inappropriately during the summertime. And then after you take into account mm -hmm. those things, um, it should you should also think about some of the sociocultural factors that an individual may have when it comes to their risk. Um, this includes things like their socioeconomic status. Uh, people who live in uh, poverty are going to be at higher risk um, because they may not have the access to cool spaces, air right. conditioning, even hydration or shade. Uh, thinking about environmental racism or structural racism, social co cohesion, um, somebody's housing status, if they're unhomed, obviously they're not going to have as readily accessible um, access to like air conditioning, literacy, as well as limited worker protections. And that last one, limited worker protections, that's going to vary state by state. Um, you know, there are some states that do have limited, uh, that have worker protections for people that work outside in, in the heat. And there's some states that very specifically actually um, do not allow for those types of protections for workers. And so being you know, cognizant of what kind of that socio-cultural or socio-political uh, environment is where you're practicing or where you're living um, is going to be important. Um, I think that also just kind of once you've risk stratified people into whether they're higher risk uh, to be vulnerable for heat-related illness, um, is just making sure that 
individuals as well as their family members, their caregivers are aware of that vulnerability status before the warm season even begins, because that's going to help empower individuals uh, to be able to take necessary precautions to manage their well-being uh, during periods of, of elevated temperatures. And so this could mean things like um, ensuring that people understand key signs and symptoms like excessive sweating or even the cessation of sweating. Uh, those are going to be key signs and symptoms um, when you're exposed to heat, um, to extreme heat. Um, also thinking about uh, providing information to people in terms of when they should seek uh, cooling mm -hmm. um, or like things like being able to turn on a fan or turn on air conditioning or, you know, find a public place nearby that has air conditioning having power outage plans. Um, and then also, if you are a clinician listening here, considering bringing in your interprofessional colleagues like social work um, or people like case managers who know about community resources uh, to help patients meet their needs. Um, of course, and we may talk about this later too, uh, for people who are at higher risk than the general population, so folks that may be athletes uh, or outdoor mm -hmm. workers, out outdoor agricultural workers, um, construction workers, those types of things, there may be additional um, counseling for prevention that needs to take place for those folks. And so thinking about frequent, frequent breaks for hydration, um, the clothes that you wear, ensuring that they're breathable or, or light colored, um, and then uh, covering or any like potentially exposed areas um, to protect it from the sun. So like hats, sunscreen, and then avoiding the midday for training or, or work, if that's at all possible. That was some great advice in general. Uh, I'd like to switch a little bit and begin talking about the respiratory system. You know, weather conditions, particularly temperature, can contribute to the development as well as the instability of several respiratory diseases. Understanding the relationship between temperature and respiratory diseases is crucial, particularly given the increasing frequency and intensity of extreme temperatures that are being caused by climate change. Um, as noted by the World Health Organization, an individual's vulnerability to heat is shaped by physiologic factors, some of which you already talked about, the age, health status, underlying conditions, and exposure factors, such as occupation, socioeconomic conditions. All the social determinants of health uh, can play a role. Published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine back in 2013, a 10-year study of Medicare respiratory hospitalizations and outdoor heat in, in 213 U.S. counties was reviewed, and it was found that the risk of respiratory hospitalization significantly increased with daily outdoor heat. And this relationship persisted across age categories, sexes, county climates, and could not be explained simply by changing concentrations of air pollution alone, which is certainly one of the concerns mm -hmm. the American Lung Association has. So you may have touched on this already, but can you talk a little bit more about your experience dealing with respiratory consequences of extreme heat? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the two biggest players in this instance um, are going to be COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as well as asthma. Mm -hmm. So we've seen both anecdotally just on shift in the emergency department, but also statistically in the medical literature that exacerbations of these chronic conditions do significantly increase in hot weather. I mean, you just cited a couple studies here that basically said just that. But why is that? Well, in hotter and more humid weather, the body needs to use additional energy to regulate the temperature. This goes back to that idea of thermal regulation that I talked at the beginning here. And so that's going to bring along some physiologic changes. It's going to increase that respiratory rate. There's going to be increased metabolic demand and oxygen demand. So basically, the body has to work harder just to maintain normal. So the body's already under some stress. Then when that hot air is breathed in, uh, hot air can actually irritate the airways and cause some inflammation and induce some coughing. Plus, the airways themselves might even be drier than usual due to maybe some relative or actual dehydration um, due to like sweating losses of, of fluid. Um, and that dryness in both the upper and the lower airways can lead to uh, the symptom of, of shortness of breath and kind of start like the, this cycle of exacerbation. And I know you've already mentioned it a little bit, and it's not completely going to explain the increased rates of the exacerbation, but during extremely high temperatures, air outdoors tends to become stagnant. And so it does trap pollutants or particulate matter. So, you know, combination of solid particles or liquid droplets in the air. So things like dust and soot or smoke from wildfires, pollens, 
various pollutants. Those are particulate matter. Um, and so those in that stagnant air just get kind of trapped. And those high levels of particulate matter are known to drive up heat-related respiratory condition exacerbations. And so higher rates of COPD exacerbations, higher rates of asthma exacerbations. And so as an emergency clinician in dealing with this, I have two pieces pieces of advice. Number one is have awareness of the weather conditions and the air conditions in the community in which you are working. So knowing that you may anticipate to see more asthma or more COPD exacerbations as temps go up, or if you're somebody who has asthma or COPD, know that you may have a lower threshold um, to end yourself up in, in an exacerbation state. Number two, the second thing I recommend from an ER standpoint is that when patients come in in the hot weather with the COPD or asthma exacerbations, and, and they will come in, the, the data backs that up, um, do what you're trained to do. Just swiftly identify, swiftly stabilize, and then manage using evidence-based medicine.